Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Donation Champions, Strategies for Developing Advocates Inside and Outside of the Hospital. Uh, my name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance, and as always, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Before we get started, there are just a few housekeeping items that I'd like to review with you all. Um, so as always, we do recommend um, accessing our webinars using the Chrome browser. If you're already using Chrome and experience any audio issues, we do recommend reconnecting to the webinar using the phone number that was provided in your confirmation email. To anyone joining us for the very first time today, please take note of the chat feature that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you're already, um, oops, <laughs> I just lost my place here. Okay, I'm going to start over really quickly. You're good. <laughs> take your time. I'm just, I'm just, I've got nothing the rest of the day. I'm just glad to have this done. So. <laughs> I was trying to do too many things at once, and I went back to the previous thing. You're totally All right. good. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and start over. Sorry. You're good. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Donation Champions, Strategies for Developing Advocates Inside and Outside of the Hospital. My name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance, and as always, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Now, before we go ahead and get started, there are just a few housekeeping items that I'd like to review. As always, to ensure an optimal visual and audio experience, it's highly recommended that you access our webinars using the Chrome browser. If you're already using Chrome and experience any audio issues, we do recommend logging back in using the um, phone number that was provided in your confirmation email. To anyone joining us for the very first time today, please take note of the chat feature that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This chat will be used to pose your questions to our presenters, so if you have any questions that come up during the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation has concluded, we'll transition into our Q&A discussion where our presenters will address as many of your questions as time allows. Now for anyone interested in our upcoming webinars, please note registration is currently open for our next transplant webinar on expanding the donor pool for utilization of perceived marginal organs. Be sure to tune in for that on March 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Registration is also open for our very first innovation webinar of the year, which will focus on DCD heart recoveries. That's coming your way on March 31st at 2 p.m. Eastern. For more information on all of our upcoming webinar offerings or to register, please visit our website at organdonationalliance.org. For those of you who are seeking uh, continuing education credits, please note we are offering one set fee credit and one nursing contact hour for this webinar. Please note we do also offer a certificate of attendance for anyone seeking CEs that are not available. Everyone joining us today is eligible to claim either of these credits or certificates. However, prior to receiving your certificate, you will be asked to complete a brief online evaluation that will allow you the opportunity to give us your valuable feedback. If you're listening in a group, as many of you are, please be sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. As a friendly reminder, you'll have 30 calendar days to complete your evaluations and claim your certificates. Now at this point in time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Erica Wilkerson, Donation Liaison at Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network. Erica, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Deanna, and thank you all for calling in today. I'm going to start off by introducing Dr. Matthew Gorman. He is the Medical Director of Quality and Safety for OSF St. Francis Medical Center and Children's Hospitals Illinois in Peoria, Illinois. He also serves as the Assistant Chief Medical Officer and Adult Hospitalist and Palliative Care Provider for OSF St. Francis Medical Center, as well as a General Internal Medicine and Pediatrics Provider for OSF Medical Group in Washington, Illinois. Dr. Gorman is a physician donation champion at OSF St. Francis Medical Center and serves as co-chair of the hospital's donation steering committee and developed and leads the donation after circulatory death physician declaring group. Next, Diane Harney. She is the nursing director of adult critical care, cardiac services, and palliative care at OSF St. Francis Medical Center in Peoria, Illinois. She is a registered nurse with over 35 years of practical experience, and she received both her Bachelor of Science in Nursing and Master of Science in Nursing Management and Leadership from St. Francis Medical Center College of Nursing. Diane currently serves as the nursing champion and liaison for Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network, the chair of the OSF St. Francis Medical Center Donation Steering Committee, and is a member of the planning committee for the annual organ and tissue donation symposiums hosted in Peoria, Illinois. She is also a member of the Critical Care Advisory Group for Nursing Leaders and the Peoria Lifesaving Leader Community Advisory Board for Gift of Hope. 
Dr. Deepak Nair is the Director of Inpatient Neuroscience Services for OSF Healthcare. In his role, he serves as the Business Director for the Inpatient Division of the Neuroscience Service Line and the Physician Manager of the Inpatient Neurology Team at OSF St. Francis Medical Center. Dr. Nair is also a Clinical Assistant Professor of Neurology at the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Peoria. He completed his fellowship in stroke and cerebral vascular disease in 2011, and he is board certified in both neurology and neurocritical neuro care. Excuse me. Dr. Nair is a physician champion at OSF St. Francis Medical Center who has served as the chair of the Critical Care Advisor Group for Physicians for the Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network Donation Service Area since 2015, has hosted and left five brain death simulation workshops, and is a member of the OSF St. Francis Medical Center Donation Steering Committee. Last is Jamie Harwood. He is a registered nurse with more than 20 years of nursing experience. He graduated from Methodist School of Nursing in 1997 with a diploma in nursing, and he completed the Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Pennsylvania State University in 2015. While studying at Penn State, Jamie completed coursework in forensic nursing and is a certified forensic nurse. In December 2016, Jamie was elected to serve as a Peoria County Coroner, where he leads a team of eight deputy coroners who respond to more than 3,000 reported deaths annually. Jamie is a living kidney donor and is a member of the Coroner Advisor Group and the Peoria Life Saving Leader Community Advisory Board for Gift of Hope. Next, I'm going to transition into um, the today's webinar overview. Um, it is an honor and privilege to have these four panelists here with us today. They really are four leaders um, from organizations that serve as gold standards in our donation service area in terms of the collaboration that they have with our teams and the relationships we've formed. Um, the overall growth and development of donation culture and respect in their respective facilities, and their overall commitment to process improvement and support of our mission. So we thank them for their time. But um, Diane's going to be leading the discussion today, giving a little bit of background about OSF Healthcare St. Francis Medical Center. Jamie will be transitioning, talking about the Peoria County Coroner's Office. Um, Dr. Nye will be leading discussion in terms of um, how do you define a donation champion or what is the anatomy of a donation champion. Well, they'll be segueing into um, speaker interviews that will be in a panel format, um, giving each person the opportunity to share their background um, and the impact they've had in donation and transplantation and their role within the hospitals. And then Dr. Gorman will be um, concluding the webinar today Oh, giving an overview of the strategies that they've defined for developing donation advocates both in the hospital and in the community, and then we'll close with the opportunity for question and answer. Um, we are a level one adult and pediatric regional trauma center, a level three neonatal ICU and perinatal cen um, center. We serve about 26 uh, county region in middle um, mid-state Illinois. We are a teaching hospital. Um, we also have a transplant services for kidney, pancreas, and heart. Last year in 2019, we were the top organ and tissue donor hospital with 36 organ donors and 166 tissue donors. We really follow our mission here at St. Francis Medical Center by serving persons with the greatest care and love in a community that celebrates the gift of life. Thank you so much for attending. We look forward to visiting with you. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Harwood. I'm a registered nurse and uh, the current coroner of Peoria County. I uh, was elected in 2016 and um, sit in the current seat. Um, across the uh, state of Illinois, there's 101 coroners um, who work uh, collaboratively with different medical centers uh, to facilitate what we call manner and cause of death. Through that process, we have the opportunity to work with families and work with the uh, medical centers to facilitate donation, whether it be organ donation or tissue donation. Here in Peoria County, we have a resident count of 180,000 people across the county, and um, we work with the three facilities here in Peoria, um, OSF St. Francis Medical Center and the two Unity Point facilities, as well as the uh, Pekin Hospital across the river. Um, it's a privilege to work with these hospitals. We work on an evidence-based practice model um, for donation, and um, it's our intent that through this model we can increase the uh, amount of donations that we have across the state and in our county. All right. Thank you, Jamie. <clears throat> so I'm going to transition to uh, a bit of an outline um, to frame what it means to be a donation champion. This is certainly representative of our experience, but not necessarily all-inclusive. Um, and I'll start by simply 
um, addressing uh, the clinical role in this um, on uh, medical service where we are actively involved in caring for potential donor patients as well as involved in, involved in the declaration of death, whether that's brain death or cardiac death. Um, it really requires some sense of the relationship between the care provider team as well, and family, but also the relationship between us and the OPO. Um, there's, that requires a sense of ownership over not only the patients, but the long-term outcomes and even the post um, death outcome. Um, that comment about coming from the world um, really requires a, a, a clinical credibility uh, so that that champion is recognized as having ownership. Um, obviously, all, all of this starts from uh, clinical standards of care and understanding what those best practices are, and this is always a moving target. Um, in my relatively short career, this has all changed dramatically, um, and it's sometimes a challenge to stay on top of that. Um, and, and also, we're all trained in our own different silos, so understanding the, the full continuum of care and the role of different uh, healthcare professionals involved both in the care of the patient uh, during their life as well as the uh, death and declaration process and then uh, transitioning over towards um, donorship. Um, that's a good segue into the, the concept of emotional intelligence. Uh, it, it would be easy to remain stuck in one's own silo um, were we not to really reflect on the role of all the key members of the care team, um, both in uh, delivering a, a sense of compassionate care to patients and families, but also working and dealing with each other as, as team members. Um, and that requires a, a lot of communication uh, at all levels of care. So uh, th this is... <laughs> This is something that's usually learned on the job, uh, but we try to take a, a, a lot of personal effort towards this. So um, in that vein, uh, I think it's also necessary for all the team members who are involved in the care of these patients to really understand and believe in the mission of the OPO um, and to really recognize that as part of the care continuum of the patient. Um, there's long been an effort to sort of uh, divorce and separate out the concept of care of the living patient and then that transition towards um, care of the dead donor. Uh, but, you know, this is all part and parcel of the total care of the patient and their family. So um, being able to recognize one's part in that continuum is really key, um, and understanding the long-term beneficial impact of donation and, and transplantation. So we all kind of get there. <clears throat> uh, uh, obviously, this is reflective not only of the care of the donor, but also the impact of the care and communication to the donor family. Um, on my end of this care continuum, I don't get to interact very often with transplant recipients, uh, but I spend quite a bit of time with uh, donors and their families, and I have personally been witness to how, how important that aspect of care is for their uh, you know, receiving the care, but also in how they deal with the death and dying process and their ability to grieve effectively and in a healthy way. Um, as a clinician, I have spent a lot of time working on process improvement, but uh, that does not happen in a silo either. So the people sitting around the table with me um, have all uh, contributed greatly to how we've improved our processes here. Um, both clinically and administratively. Uh, sometimes we uh, forget the fact that uh, behind the scenes of clinical care, there's an army of other people who are helping to support that work. Um, and that, that's how we can continue to really track how well we're doing this and continue to improve you know, on an ongoing way. Um, I, I think that focus on process improvement really uh, comes from the desire of everyone on the care team to uh, help see things happen more effectively and efficiently, provide a better communication, more, more clarity to all the team members as well as families, uh, remove any barriers that might exist, and ensure that that process continues to work smoothly. Um, and if everyone was not committed to that, that would be really challenging to make that happen. Um, and it's only together as a team that we can then make that change. And most of the time, we all have different competing needs and interests and priorities during our day. So 
uh, that, that communication part remains key to ensuring that we're all uh, focused and aligned on, on the same goal. And in this case, it's again making sure that good critical care is being provided to the patient up, in, up to and beyond the point where we recognize that recovery is likely not possible. And then when we understand that the transition towards death has happened, that we're acting in a timely fashion to confirm that, to communicate clearly with families, and to explain the rest of the care continuum that happens beyond that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Um, next, we're going to transition into the panel discussion and kind of speaker interviews. I'd like to break it down by person, but there may be some opportunities for the group to chime in, too. Um, but really, the goal here is to introduce some of the work that these individuals have been involved with, um, how they've developed and grown as champions, and really developed and grown the donation culture within the organizations that they work in. So, um, Diane, as facility champion at OSF St. Francis Medical Center and someone who sees the importance of engaging managers and mission partners, how would you describe the culture of OSF St. Francis Medical Center as it relates to donation? I think that we have a very engaged workforce that has grown over the years. Um, I think that we have a lot more departments that want to be included. Uh, organ donation touches many departments. While most of all the patients are usually in the ICU or maybe come in through the ED, you still have other disciplines that touch um, the donors' lives, and they want to be included. We recently initiated an honor walk um, developed a whole process here, and I think that that has really increased the awareness because we really disseminated that information throughout the organization. And it, and it starts from the top down. We have um, administrators that are very supportive of organ donation and really help us to be the best that we can and really review um, how they can um, be helpful in increasing the awareness throughout um, St. Francis. Or, and through our, or through our ministry as well. Great. So you mentioned uh, leadership, or supportive leadership, but how else do you believe the hospital donation culture has grown and developed to what it is today? I did not start as the champion. I, I took it over from a very engaged individual, and I think that that, just, that really talks about passing the torch. Um, really, I became um, the, leader, the leader. I had always been a member of that, and I think that that's how you do it. You have some passionate leaders. I know that all of the uh, managers within our ICUs are very committed, um, and they have a sincere passion for uh, the gift of donation, and I think that that helps. We really have increased our attendance in the steering committee, again, you know, with the honor walk, and then we have a subgroup with honoring the gift on how we can make organ donation um, a greater awareness within our, um, our facility and then throughout the community. Again, we have uh, a symposium that we have hosted here for two years, and it is very well attended. I mean, we have over 250 um, um, people that have attended the last year. We also really speak about the gift, you know, family connections, people within the community, you know, high profile people, and we really have talked about um, a, a flag ceremony that is greatly attended by many within the community. Um, we have, a, 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 like I said, the dedicated team. We have a wonderful relationship with our OPO, um, and I think that that is essential as well. They're a part of our um, our steering committee, and we work at removing any barriers or any gaps that we see, and I think that it's a very transparent, uh, per respectful relationship, and I think that that has been very helpful as well. Um, and like I said, we're looking at top-down. We also have um, the critical care physicians, uh, um, and, and everybody is really on the same page and belong to the steering committee, and I'm thankful we have you know, the physicians here are um, very engaged and are helpful in removing any gaps as well. Can you describe how you see culture impacting the timeliness of referrals and family conversations for donation cases, especially for a donation after circulatory death? Now, this is, this is tricky because I think that um, referral timeliness is a gap throughout. Um, I think that you have to have and it's very individualized. 
it's very individualized according to you know the family's acceptance and grief. But you have to start those conversations early, and you have to um, you know make sure that there is a team communication. Um, if you're discussing donation with somebody that doesn't agree or isn't on board with the process, you're not likely to see as many referrals. And so, again, that goes back to your engaged workforce. I think the other opportunity here um, is when you have gaps or you find where there's a delay, working with your OPO and the hospital to really dig deeper as to what the root cause is. And I will say that it, it takes time for that to develop. Um, and I've been doing this many years and have seen where we've closed now our referral. Um, and I think that's the other thing is that the hospitals really do want to engage and be more proactive, but they have to understand where the gaps are. And so I think as an OPO, you can identify where there are, but also not come in as an accusatory, but also come in as how can we be, how can we close the gap? And I think that's key that establishing that relationship that it's a partnership moving forward is, is, is something that can strategically be important for everyone. Agreed. What advice do you have for the audience today so that they can transform their culture into a positive one that supports donation, whether at a large or a small facility? I don't think it really matters on the size of the facility. I think that you have to have an engaged workforce. I think I've talked about that more than once. Um, you have to have a steering committee. A, um, the size of it's based on the size of the facility. You have to understand the challenges. Um, and then you have to, like Dr. Um, Gorman spoke and as Dr. Nair as well, is that you have to really look at what are the, where are the gaps and where you really need to, um, to change that. Um, I really believe in the, the recipient and the donor stories. I think they're very impactful and I think that it really helps um, build that engaged workforce have them share the stories. Um, it kind of helps the donor and their families bring peace. Um, again, as I spoke about the, the debriefing, um, we, we accept feedback. I don't think that we uh, <coughs> limit ourselves and understanding about where are the opportunities and we always feel like we can do better. And I think that that's something that works very well um, at OSF Healthcare here in St. Francis. And based on your experience, what advice would you give OPOs or hospitals for developing donation champions at their designated institution? I have already reached out. I share my agendas. I share my beliefs. Um, we shared our process for the honor walks. I think that, again, just being very transparent about what has worked and what needs to be put in place. We have a, a BPA referral that's helped us with our referrals, but we're always looking at how else we can increase the number of referrals throughout. And it's a very collaborative spirit, and I think that that's essential. Um, I like the fact that we have a limited um, number of um, liaisons, and they have built relationships throughout all our departments. Um, and then I just think you still continually always look for where there's opportunities for improvement. Thank you, Diane. So next, I'm going to transition over to Dr. Nair, who is the Director of Inpatient Neuroscience Services. Would you please share why you think it's important to have donation champions for hospitals or in the community? Dr. Nair. Uh, certainly. Um, any of the clinicians listening in will um, uh, have experience with this. But death and dying is already a difficult topic, um, you, you know, depending on uh, where you're at culturally. We tend not to focus on just you know, death as part of the care process. Um, and though there's you know, uh, been a great deal of public education on the uh, um, you know, val value of things like advanced directives, um, most of the patients I take care of still haven't thought through these um, uh, concerns. And a lot of my practice is really focused around the care of patients who are actively dying. Um, and that's often difficult for families um, to, to recognize, much less accept and, and learn to, uh, you know, ha have an effective decision-making process. So it, having people who are engaged in the care of these patients and, and champions for, um, you, you know, care, care of this population as well as the donation process can be a real effective way to help those families really wrap their heads around all of this, um, you know, support each other through the decision-making process and, and the death and declaration process as well. 
Could you please share how and why you got involved with Gift of Hope? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my first clinical experience in dealing with a potential donor patient was my very first on-call experience as a neurology intern. Um, I uh, was consulting on a uh, very young 18-year-old um, patient who was a hanging victim, um, and the patient's parents were not much older than me. And I was a, a rank novice, um, both clinically and with my communication skills, and I realized that um, you know, anyone else probably could have done a better job for that family than I was able to at that, at that moment. Uh, luckily, I, I had a lot of support from both the ICU staff as well as the attending I was working with, um, but that really stuck with me that um, there were, there were a, a great number of skills that I still needed to learn, and that, that was a, a point of focus um, throughout my training. And after I uh, graduated from uh, training and joined the, the group here, uh, my chairman actually asked if I'd uh, be willing to work with um, uh, the OPO and um, kind of help develop some standards around this. So that started my relationship with Gift of Hope, and um, uh, your predecessor <laughs> uh, invited me to, uh, to attend a simulation workshop built around the skills of brain death. And I already, I'd already been in practice for a year or two at that point, and so I thought, well, this would you know, just be a nice experience for me to see how the simulation course worked. Um, but as a participant in the program, I realized, um, you know, I was not adept at this as I thought. Um, I really struggled through the course, and uh, it was a somewhat personally embarrassing for me. Uh, my preceptor in the course was some, uh, someone who's uh, fairly well-known in the field, and I looked up to a great deal. And it just struck me that relatively minor changes in the environment really threw me out of my normal clinical workflow. And, um, and even when I was doing the crucial conversation part of the program with um, a standardized actor portraying a family member, I really struggled to get out the concept that brain death is death. Um, and uh, it really hit home that I need a way to get better at this myself, but also how to teach how to get better at this. As a result of this experience, what did you do next? Uh, so actually I came uh, back to my program and talked to our residency program director and asked uh, you know, if this is something that we could replicate here, um, and our program coordinator, Tammy, helped me reach out uh, to both the university and the simulation um, uh, 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 faculty at uh, the Jump Simulation Center here, and uh, then started dragging in uh, all the people that we work with on a regular basis, both from Goods of Hope as well as our ethics director, and together we built a curriculum that was cribbed from the initial program I went to. Um, and we really focused on sort of two aspects, which is the actual clinical skill, which is actually sort of the minor part of this, and then really trying to hone in on the key communication pieces that are important to this aspect of care. Um, and this has been an ongoing project. We, we're still uh, constantly revising our curriculum and, and trying to get it better every time. I'm personally very grateful for your work with that, but would you mind sharing what um, impact the development and execution of the Brain Death Simulation Workshop has had on the learners who have participated? Um, certainly. Uh, primarily, it's one of awareness. So over the last several years, we've done five different workshops, a uh, total of 57 learners. Um, our next one's coming up in less than a month, and um, just over these years, uh, this has really shown a spotlight on care of the donor patient. Um, and a better awareness of the death and dying process and what declaration really looks like and how we can do it better. Uh, so I feel like this has become part of the culture here um, in our ICUs and, and across the hospital. Great. Aside from the brain death simulation workshop, what else have you and your team done to make the declaration of brain death for those who are presenting as brain death a standard of care? Um, so uh, in addition to the simulation course, um, we do regular teaching within um, uh, our residency program in neurology, um, as well as uh, regular um, uh, conversations with some of the other training programs here, our medical ICU residency um, uh, cohorts, uh, our palliative care fellowship program, um, uh, working within my team itself, we're um, always reviewing uh, best practices um, and ensuring that we're, we're trying to uh, you know, build some consistency around how everyone does this. Um, we've developed some templates uh, for how we document our brain death assessments and communications with families and team members. Uh, and
And so, you know, this has all also been part of uh, the sort of culture of donor care here. Um, and it's helped raise that level of awareness um, across multiple departments. Thank you, Dr. Nyer. So next I'll introduce um, Dr. Gorman if, if, if he, as the Medical Director for Quality and, Safe, and Safety. Um, would you please share how you became involved with Gift of Hope? Um, well, I started as a resident. Unfortunately, I had a, a, a brain death uh, asphyxiation in the car um, where a dad left the a child in the car and overheated. Um, and we saw the benefit of that in terms of the healing that it offered the family um, in a huge time of grief. And then when I went into private practice, our APN actually worked the Gift of Hope organ uh, recovery uh, nurse. And so we saw it there, and then I had firsthand experience when my patient's getting that organ. But I really got involved on the other side of Gift of Hope and informatics role um, and seeing that our uh, kidney transplant uh, costs were higher than the national average. And so that kind of started getting in terms of how we can process and prove our process at, at the hospital in terms of just improving the process of organ donation. Great. Um, why have you continued to stay involved and engaged with Gift of Hope? Well, I see true value. The other thing is it's another duty is assigned in one of my many roles <laughs> of uh, chief medical officer. But I really do see a value because um, I think that when it's done well, um, there's benefit to everyone, care provider, family, um, but also the future that we don't meet in terms of the organs that are procured um, that go into other uh, and sustain life. So, I mean, I think that's truly where the true benefit is, and it's the unknown impact um, of where things are. And you see the connections and you hear the stories, and that's what keeps you going. Given your background in quality, you have an exceptional eye for process improvement. What would you tell OPOs listening today to do to be better partners with their hospitals? I think the first thing is don't be afraid to ask questions, um, but do it in a non-threatening way. I think that's probably the lesson learned from many years of working with um, our OPO is that uh, when done in a, way, in a way that's not threatening uh, from both sides, because I think we've asked questions of the OPO that first gets defensive, and I think we've overcome that. I think we've established relationships. So first, I think you have to have the relationship to, to know that it's okay to improve. But many of the places you're at are academic centers. Really, process improvement is really what it's all about. I mean, it's, it, it, there is failure. Um, but then first, don't fear the failure, but learn from it. And I think that's where every one of us in an academic organization has failure. But it's how we respond to it to make it better. I think that's the important thing. Can you tell us about your involvement with the DCD Declaring Physician Group at OSF St. Francis Medical Center and how many physicians are a part of it? Um, unfortunately, this came out of some of our failures because this all started because um, we couldn't really find a declaring physician all the time. Um, in Illinois, it has to be a physician that declares uh, the patient, um, and that can take anywhere from two to three hours. And of course, these happen at the most opportune time at two or three in the morning. Um, and so putting this on our residents um, put them in very awkward positions because we probably didn't do a very good job of training them how to do this. It was just in time training, um, but it's just something that they're just not very comfortable with because they're, they're trained to heal people, not to, um, and you can do it in a comfortable way. It just created some anxiety for some of the clinicians. And so we took this over and gave a standardized process, and I think it has really helped the teams that go through this because it's a much more standardized approach. There's not huge variation that we were seeing in review. Um, and then I think that we resolved some of the ethical issues that some of our residents were having. Um, we kind of went through this ahead of time, but then once they went through it, and we've had some residents come with us, um, and I think when they see it done in a, in a regimented way, um, and that's the future thing. Now we have three, three uh, FT equivalents, not full time, but uh, we have four physicians, but one is kind of really, really part time now. So, but we have, um, I would say, two and a half physicians that are covering this need on a 24-7, 365 component um, with resident backup. If, if, if we, we are not in town, that's probably the only thing. Holidays, sometimes Christmas becomes problematic in terms of covering, but um, it's really a program that I'm proud of because I think we really have improved the quality um, for the organization um, and uh, alleviated a lot of fears from some of our care team members. That's great. 
So you've covered some of the next question, but can you explain more? Tell us why you think it's important to have a dedicated DCD declaring physician group. Kind of summarize that. I think it just, it, the real thing is consistency and reducing variation and becoming more highly reliable. And that's something that we take to heart. Um, and I will say that previously we weren't very reliable and we weren't high functioning. And so I think limiting this, and it doesn't always have to be attendings, you can definitely do it with okay. residents or fellows. It's just work hour restrictions really makes that very impractical. Um, and so this is why we've kind of restricted to attending level um, versus the residents and fellows that we have just because we don't want to impact their duty hour restrictions. I'm trying to be respectful. So those are on my to-do list of trying to incorporate that, um, but it has not, it's fallen with all the other urgencies of the day. Um, COVID-19 is the urgency today, um, but those are just some of the things that we are looking at, at trying to improve. What advice would you give another hospital about establishing a group like this? Uh, it does take someone with emotional intelligence, um, so I think it's finding the right physician, um, finding the right providers um, that can definitely, because uh, every family you meet in their crisis, and some are fantastic through it, and you have to ease that transition. And some, though, um, you could write a book about it in terms of you just can't make this stuff up. And if you did, I would say that that, that couldn't happen. So, um, and I think it's openness. And I think openness to have conversations with the medical staff. It's openness to understand and, and get them that you're not Dr. Kevorkian, um, that there are components with this. I think having clear ex clarity with families um, that, that you're going to make medications that make them comfortable and do it in a compassionate way really does, is effective. And so, um, but how to do this is the LPO really needs to understand the medical staff, probably working with the chief medical officer or whoever the physician is, the champion. Um, and it may not be that champ, may not be that person because if they're an ICU physician, they may not find that that's their role. Um, and they may be the, the brain death declarer. Um, and so finding where that is, a hospitalist, uh, maybe more practical, um, just in terms of time uh, allotment. Uh, that's another thing, um, but it, it may take some searching to find the right right person. But it really is the right fit um, that I, the OPO probably needs to cultivate. Thank you for your feedback, and thank you for all the support you've provided our families in the OR. Um, next, Jamie. So, um, Peoria County Coroner. Despite all efforts and work done in our hospitals to facilitate organ and tissue donation for a patient or a patient's family who has given consent, there can still be roadblocks, such as a coroner not giving release to make donation, to making donation happen. Jamie, as a donation champion and coroner, how do you balance advocating for donation and maintaining your role as coroner? I think, I think it needs to be understood really what our job is, the coroner um, across the state, and it's, it's the determined manner and cause of death. If we're able to do that, determine determination of manner and cause of death and facilitate donation, then it's a win-win. And it's been my experience over the last three and a half years that most often, and I would say most often, greater than 95% of the time, there should not be a roadblock um, for donation to occur despite our state statute of responsibility of manner and cause of death. It, it, should, be, it should be an easy flow to be done. Diane, Dr. Nyer, and Dr. Gorman have illustrated the importance of hospital donation champions. Please describe the importance of coroners also being donation champions. You know, like I said, we, we determine manner and cause of death. We're the curator of, of the body once, it's, once the person's been pronounced dead. Unless the coroner has a general understanding of the human body, how someone dies, the pathophysiology, sometimes the trauma of, of the cause of death, um, without that knowledge uh, and the coroner not having that, donation wouldn't occur. Um, we have the final say of whether donation can go forward or not or whether we halt the process and take jurisdiction over the body. So um, the coroner needs to have that, that general education of the donation process um, and manner and cause of death and, and really how the body dies so we can proceed forward. Great. Can you share how the culture of donation has evolved in the Peoria County, County Coroner's Office? Um, when I took office back in uh, December of 16, we had a foundation of donation. Uh, the relationship with the Gift of Hope had already been established, but what was lacking um, was the number of referrals being made to the Gift of Hope. Um, in my last three years there, we've generated some core values um, in which our employees are held accountable, and a few of those are accountability and responsibility. 
So when I ask my staff, what's your responsibility and your accountability to a donation, they know that we make referrals on every single one of our deaths that we're involved in, home deaths, motor vehicle collisions, um, deaths by suicide and, and whatnot. Um, and that's our responsibility and that's our accountability that I hold them to um, for all of our deaths. And in that comes a degree of compassion and care for the families who are left behind and offering them um, the premise that their loved one still has a mark in this world and can still be remembered in the manner of um, donation. Um, as you mentioned before, I'm a living donor. This week actually marks the eighth year out from my living um, kidney donation. And my recipient um, has become a grandmother since our donation. So when I think about that, I think about um, how much more can be changed in the realm of donation um, with my experience. So. That's wonderful. Congratulations thank and thank you. you. So even with the culture you've instilled in your office, there can still be some very challenging cases and situations. What are some examples of the challenging situations you faced while working with Gift of Hope? You know, I think Dr. Gorman mentioned, mentioned earlier is this doesn't come without some challenges and um, experiences that we've all learned from. We had a case a few months ago that was really, really challenging. And um, what we learned from that was to better collaborate, to better focus on what's best practice um, and moving forward with all of our cases. So from that experience, what, what we've done moving forward is we've gone organ by organ in the body, um, where's the cause of death and what's viable for transplantation. Um, and doing that in that manner, precisely organ by organ, has made a difference in, in the case that we had most recently where we were successfully able to um, proceed with donations. So um, it's been challenging and it's been a learning experience for all of us. I think the benefit is, uh, and not every coroner's office is going to have this, is I worked at St. Francis for nine years, so I have established relationships, and so um, it's, it's really made a difference in how well we collaborate. And can you share what your collaboration did look like with the OPO during those difficult cases? Uh, you know, the donation didn't happen, and I'm not afraid to say that the donation didn't happen, um, but what we did following that is we all recognized, all of our donation champions here um, realized that we missed a mark and maybe missed a mark in some way. So we came together and we collaborated um, with my liaison um, and with yourself um, to figure out what, what would be best practice and how can we move forward and change that process. How do you inspire your forensic partner colleagues or what advice do you have for OPOs for inspiring forensic partners who aren't supportive of donation and processes involved? You know, there's a lot of barriers to this. Um, it, there's so many moving parts um, from the coroner's office standpoint. Um, a lot of it depends on where the death occurs, whether it's in the hospital, whether it's out in the middle of a cornfield, um, someone's house, um, anywhere like that, it's gonna make it more challenging. Um, and, and victims of violence are even a greater challenge and we have to um, narrow down where's the cause of death and how can we move forward with that. That poses some a lot of questions as far as state's attorney's offices are concerned um, in smaller counties. Um, what is evidence-based best practice? Who's involved? How well has your relationship with your law enforcement been established? And um, being able to take all of this into one picture and collaborate it. I'm fortunate again. Um, I would recommend that any coroner's office who doesn't know who their state's attorney is, um, who their local sheriff is, who the local um, brass and their police departments are to get to know those people. Um, especially if, if you have a passion for donation and you believe in the process, because those people are going to be the ones that you're going to have to work with collaboratively to make it happen. And that's what we do every day. I, can, I have my state's attorney on speed dial, my county sheriff, the chief of police here in Peoria, and I call them. Um, and we have a relationship now over the last three years where they trust my judgment. They trust that despite um, having a victim of a homicide, maybe with a gunshot to the head or even to the chest, that we can still proceed with donation of a heart, of lungs, um, especially if we have a cause of death in the abdomen or in the head, so. Thank you. So your advocacy for donation is apparent in your role in office as coroner, but also in the hospital and local community. Can you please share with us how you're involved? Yeah, my staff knows um, that we're going to make a referral on every one of our donations from home uh, to wherever that geography is. We've doubled our referral cases um, from 18 and 19, and into 20, we uh, seek to continue making those referrals from every one of those cases. Um, moving forward, what we'd like to do as well is um, being able to converse with families on the scene regarding that donation process. Um, our current 
um, process right now is we make the referral to the gift of hope and they make that initial contact with the family. Um, my staff is very well trained um, in the donation process. Most of them have been there for um, three, three plus years. Um, for us to be able to make that contact with the family, and I think that might uh, really make a difference in our conversion of our referrals to actual donors. Um, the other thing that we want to do, um, I, need, I, I have a donation coordinator with the coroner's office. Her name is Gina Martin. We would like to use our best practice model and take it out to the other coroners um, across the state of Illinois um, who may not have the education that I have um, and be able to share with them what our process looks like and the success of that process. And really at the end of the day, and I know Diana said this, um, it's, what, it's, it's the end product of that donor family and what that outcome looks like. And, and life does go on. And there is hope beyond that horrible tragedy that that family is going through. Thank you for sharing. Um, next, I'll transition um, to Dr. Gorman if you want to lead the discussion and strategies for engaging and developing advocates for donation that you guys came up with collectively as a group. I hope we've answered a lot of these already, um, but you can see from the screen, uh, I mean, the first is really develop relationships based on mutual interest. It may be job roles that get you started in terms of the chiefs or the executive leadership, but it may be the unit leaders in terms of critical care. Um, and then it's really building the network from that. I think where we found great success is our steering committee has grown um, almost exponentially or doubled um, in, in a very short amount of time as we get different in opinions, but also like-minded uh, around the same common theme of, of expanding donation and where there's opportunities. And that does take time, and I think the big thing is it takes time, and you have to cultivate that trust for when you need it. Um, and I think Jamie speaks to that in terms of the trust um, with um, the state's attorney is significant, um, but that didn't come overnight. And so I think it, it is a day by day. And there are going to be good days and bad days, but then don't get too discouraged on the bad days. Um, the next is really um, opportunities for engagement of the work, is having our committee members engaged in different avenues. Um, and we have the donation committee that we've, we've spoken to. We always like acronyms, um, and so the critical care advisory group. Um, and then our life-saving leaders is really a group in the community in which we have community leaders um, that can definitely champion. And I think that's one opportunity that hospitals neglect um, is the community benefit. And, and usually the hospital is a pillar of the community. Um, and then tapping into other pillars within that community really can expand your reach um, and I think there's subpopulations that we have challenges where um, either religious or ethnicity beliefs within that subculture um, and having a leader within that culture really does help um, have that conversation. And sometimes we've had either rabbis or a religious, if that's the cultural identity or within the leader and tapping into that is significant of having conversations about organ donation because there's a lot of people in our community that fear health care. Um, because they, you know, people go to the hospital and die, um, and so they just have a fear of healthcare. And then when you talk about organ donation, there's even more. So I think having some of those opportunities to be in the community and be in a positive, um, then when they're in the time of criticality, um, they actually know you and, and it's not a threat. Um, the other thing is understanding the motivation um, based on role and as well as organizational interest. And again, this really comes from understanding who you work with um, and taking time. Um, having conversations that not just is about um, uh, organ donation, but just understanding people. And I think this group that around us, we have a good time. Um, I think one of the fear we had is not breaking out in laughter. There's a lot of laughter around this table. And I think you got to support that. And I think that's one of the things that I can say that um, everyone around this table would like to go and have a beer or have a drink with one another or have a, a, a tonic. Um, whichever the case may be, but I think we enjoy each other's company, and I think there's something to be said for that. Um, the other thing is learn from our mistakes, and I think Jamie pointed out there was a case that didn't go very well, and we learned from it, and I think that's the big thing is we don't dissect every case, but we could, um, but there's many cases where we just quest ask critical questions, and it's okay to say, how could we do that better? And I think that's the big thing is really process improvement, and it could be just how we communicate to one another. It could be how we communicate to, to loved ones or extended family, or how our clinical team handled that um, before it transitioned. And I think there's always opportunities in just about every case if you really look for it. Sometimes that can be exhausting, but at the same token, in many cases, though, you can have a much bigger impact by making small changes. Um, 
The other thing is share the outcome um, because I think a lot of people, uh, and I will tell you my, from when I was a resident, I never knew what the outcome was. Um, even though I cared for that patient for four days, I never knew what happened. And so I think closing the loop to all those from the surgical tech to the coroner to the deputies to you know the person who declared him brain death to um, even if EVS is on the team, they get an email just kind of saying you know the impact that they, they had, and you don't know how that impact can have because they get they feel like they're part of the team and they feel like they know what happened, and then they can promote that to all the different environments they walk in, and so that is something that's been eye opening to me. But also we have a feedback loop of just saying thank you for their time, and that's been incredible because there are people that I don't know, as we have many different mission partners, our employees, um, that you just send a small email of just saying thank you for your time and dedication and promoting the gift, and it does have positive reward that I may never know for many years to come. The other thing is if you don't have a, a donation committee, I would work on one um, at, at the local hospital, um, and whether the OPO has one as well, but I think establishing that, getting people around the table, um, and obviously surgical um, leadership, um, the critical care leadership needs to be there, but even pastoral care, um, ethics, um, and then the clinical team members need to be there as well. Um, and then having identifying champions, and if you can't, if they're not naturally there, you may have to appoint some, but then grow and foster them. And I think that's the big thing is growth is, is a real opportunity that we've learned around this table. And then the other thing that we're very proud of is Institute and Honor Walk. I can't tell you how the impact is as I've been through many of them. Each one is different, um, but the impact on the family, but also the mission partners as they kind of line the halls of our critical care as they um, take the patient down to the OR. The impact that it has, you have to be careful because we've had one where it just got out of hand in terms of size because it was a young child um, that had a huge impact on the community. Mm. Um, and sometimes you can't anticipate that. Um, sometimes you can, and when you know, you can definitely make different occasions for that. But I think the impact that has on everybody and those participating and those that are innocent bystanders is significant. So I think that if you don't have one, strongly consider and reach out. You'll have our contact information at the end. But it really does have an impact and can grow the awareness. And so I think that's something that from our employees, but the impact for the family members to see you know, these are people that they've never touched, but then they see their only loved ones and friends and families, and the teenager that died, it made me almost come to tears just seeing it. Um, and it, that emotional connection then people can tell that story and relive that story has a huge effect on just the positive of, of this tragedy that that family is going through. I, I would echo the the value and importance of the donation steering committee. Um, in one of the questions that Eric and I had discussed earlier, I, to me, I felt as though the you know convening of that team together really changed the culture of donation recognition at this hospital. Uh -huh. I um, agree with that. And I, I felt like that helped people, um, both the members of the steering committee as well as just all, you know, all of our staff here really see themselves as champions. Um, you know, it, it was less structured, and I think people all felt uh, committed to the process of, of the care of the donor patient prior to that, but this sort of gave them permission to openly engage in that work and work together. We have very, uh, we have a lot of um, administrative recognition for um, different processes that include organ donation. So, and that's seen by much of the management team. We just had one recently where you know a, a patient was passing away, and the family wanted a military um, burial. I mean, a. a recognition, and so one of our mission partners or staff members' husband came in and uh, provided that, and it was a wonderful experience to be included in the honor walk, and it was, it was recognized um, at our management team, and so I think that when I talk about top-down involvement and engagement, that's essential as well. All right, so we want to thank you all for your time this afternoon, and want to open the stage for any questions that you that you might have after hearing these panelists speak. 
Barbara, we see your question uh, on the screen. Um, I, as the coroner, am not a member of the OSF donation team. However, um, like I mentioned before, we work very collaboratively. One of the things that we learned from our best practice um, was early notification of my office, even before the pronouncement of a brain death declaration. Um, that, in, that allows us to um, decipher through the medical record, collaborate with my forensic pathologist, and so we can figure out what organs have or have not been involved um, in the cause of death um, moving forward. So it, it allows us to start that process really, really quickly. Um, like I said, I have an advantage. Um, we work so collaboratively and so closely together, um, we can start that right away. So I feel like I'm a part of that donation team um, at the very beginning. Well, and you're part of the life-saving leaders that was in with, within the community too. So we do have a lot of touch points. You're welcome. All right, I'm just going to jump in very briefly just to remind folks um, as you all um, start to submit your questions, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the process, um, the Q&A um, chat feature is going to be located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. So if you do have any questions for either of our panelists, please feel free to go ahead and submit your questions there. Um, in the meantime, I do have this poll up for those of you who are um, listening in a group. If you could please just complete this poll to let us know how many people are participating in your uh, respective group, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, but with that being said, we'll go ahead and continue to allow the questions to roll in um, before concluding today's webinar. Um, this is Diane. I see that there's another question about an honor walk. We don't have an overhead chime. What we do have is a announcement that, um, it, an alert that goes to every computer 30 minutes before um, the honor walk is to starting and then 10 minutes or 10 or 5. Five or 10 minutes right before so that um, the, all disciplines can come to the department. You're welcome. So part of the donation subcommittee is honoring the gift. And really what that's looking at is what else can we do? And the honor walk came from out of that committee. So we're looking at how we can really look at maybe a, a, a memorial wall. What other things can we put in place? We also, within that committee, look at how um, for donor, you know, donor month, um, what we can put in place to have at our facility. We're putting a kiosk this year. We have t-shirts made. We're doing a flag raising. Um, so we do a lot of different um, I want a shirt. Um, information about what we can have included in the month of April. We are an epic shop, and so our BPA was created internally. Um, there's several components that go into that, um, and we can, anyone who's interested, we can definitely uh, share what we have within it, um, and then they can, they can configure with their IT committee um, because there's certain uh, triggers that are firing it, um, but we can definitely share what that is, and then you can talk to your own IT folks and how they can replicate that. There's, it's no magic. Um, and we're freely happy to share that. One other question for you. Um, when there are opportunities for process improvement as it relates to a referral or a case, what steps are typically taken to close those gaps and ensure that there's a continued growth in partnership and the relationship with your OPL? <laughs> well, I think
think we can all chime in there. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it it starts with either um, the hospital identifying an opportunity um, or the OPO finding an opportunity or even the coroner because um, I think we've had examples of all of them. So I think anyone can, we've gotten to the point where any one of the group can definitely say, hey, and we'll, if need be, we can convene with a small group or bring it to our steering committee um, where we have case reports and, and then have discussions. And then there can be subcommittees that drive out of that to kind of really look and see where, where that is. And then we do look to make sure that the solutions that we've implemented are, are do stick. Obviously, um, many of you have experienced process improvements where you're back three years later doing the same process improvement because the solution didn't stick. Um, we're not immune to that. So we do recognize that we do have to kind of make sure that whatever we do improves, sticks, um, and holds it to uh, really improving the process. I think it starts with the relationship. Um, you know, on the front end of all of this, uh, I interact uh, frequently with uh, our Gift of Hope personnel, um, and I often um, function as a liaison between the OPO staff and our, and our clinical staff. Um, you know, I, I also play a bit of a leadership role within my own group, so that, that, that's, that's helpful. Um, when there are like clinical questions, it's not uncommon for uh, you know, Erica's team from Gift of Hope to reach out to me directly uh, by phone call or text and, and ask a clinical question. Um, if there's some doubt as to how well the process is working, sometimes I can intervene on the fly um, and ensure that good communi communication and good care is happening. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the earlier you can jump on those, those aspects of care, uh, the better we can, you know, veer away from any potential errors or gaps in communication. Um, and uh, so I suspect a lot of that is done uh, without any real formal structure other than the, just the nature of the relationship between the care team and the OPO. Um, and then, it, you know, the, the, that, that reduces the number of cases that actually require some more formalized review um, because we're all learning as we go in real time. All right. Well, thank you. It looks like uh, that just about concludes our Q&A. I don't think we have any additional questions. So. Um, I'll go ahead and conclude our webinar for today. So, um, of course, on behalf of the Alliance, I'd like to thank Diane, Dr. Nair, Dr. Gorman, and Jamie for such a well-rounded discussion on the significant impact of Donation Champions, and of course, more importantly, for sharing your personal experience as champions in your respective roles. Additionally, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Erica for coordinating and facilitating today's discussion. Um, we appreciate all of your efforts in putting together today's presentation, so we'll certainly thank you all. And to our participants, as always, we thank you for taking the time to join us, and we look forward to seeing you again um, in the future. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.